Welcome to the Open Apple Podcast, where we celebrate the Apple II. Whether you're a longtime user, a nostalgic visitor, or a newcomer to the community, join us as we share news and memories of Steve Wozniak's most famous personal computer. Welcome to the latest edition of the Open Apple Podcast. This is Mike McGinnis, and with me as always is... Ken Gagney. Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing all right. So what have you been up to this past month or so? Well, just today I came from Total Confusion, or Total Con, which is a board game convention in Mansfield, Massachusetts, where I bumped into Jeannie and Thomas Compter, Apple II users. And did it leave you totally confused? <laughs> Actually, their registration process was a nightmare. I've never seen so terrible an online form, and it makes me more grateful for Kansas Fests. Wow. Yeah. That says a lot, because some of those early Kansas Fest registration forms were kind of a bear. I'll allow that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it wasn't it wasn't the form that was bad, but you had to print it out and, and fill it in by hand and scan it back in and email it off. And I, I'm just I'm grateful that things are the way they are today. Yes, it is true that we have not always had an online registration form, which was embarrassing for a computer convention. However, this is an issue that has been addressed for many years now. Indeed. Yes. So, let us not dwell on the past. This is an Apple II podcast, after all. That's right. Boldly going, or something. Yes. And what about you, Mike? I understand you've had some time to focus on your Apple II projects lately. I have. My wife has been out of the country for about a week and a half now, so I've had some time to get some things done. I, I took the opportunity to thoroughly clean an Apple IIc inside and out. And it was oh, and I I built a and this is not really related to the Apple II that much, but I I built a, a Nixie II clock, and that was fun. I had a good time doing that. I'm sorry, I haven't heard of that before. What is it? Well, Nixie tubes are they're similar to vacuum tubes, um, but instead of a vacuum, they're they're filled with a weak mix of of neon gas and maybe a little bit of uh, argon, and then they have um, some electronic components in there where when electricity is is applied to a certain piece of the tube, it lights up so you have numbers appear in the tube. These are what uh, scientific instrumentation used to display numbers before LEDs really got uh, cheap and took over. NASA used them in the Apollo computers. You'd see them in old scopes and things like that. It's become sort of a, a little retro hobby community in itself, building projects with these Nixie tubes. And uh, I found a guy online who was he'd bought a kit a while back to to build and never got around to it, so he sold it to me for about thirty dollars, and uh, I put it together, and it's pretty cool. So if you wanted to buy one new nowadays, can you still do that? Yeah, there there are some places online that you can get them. I think new they sell for 150 to 200 dollars, uh, which is more than I wanted to pay, but I got this one for about 50 bucks. So hmm. sounds like such a deal. Yeah, it was fun. So before we get too far into this month's episode, we should offer some corrections from the last one because it seems that we can't go one episode without upsetting somebody. And boy, did we succeed! Last <laughs> boy, we got a bunch of them for you. You know, life is in the details. So let's see. We have one from Ivan Drucker, creator of A2 Server, and he says, For what it's worth, A2 Server doesn't and can't make use of the Ethernet card. Rather, you need to use a local talk to Ethernet bridge and also an Apple II workstation card, if you have a 2E, in order to get things hooked up. And he offers a link, which we will put in the show notes for anybody who wants more details about any of those features. Next. The carte blanche card, which we briefly mentioned last month and more extensively in our 2011 end-of-year roundtable. It is worth noting that Steve Howell is the creator of that card. Alex Freed certainly did play a role in its uh, distribution and marketing and I believe some of the software, but the hardware is Steve Howell's creation. We always want to give credit where it's due, and we do apologize if we have slighted any member of the community. Uh, it is not due to intention, but merely ignorance. And that's certainly a quality I've never denied having. Me either, Ken. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. I've never denied that you have a lot of ignorance. <laughs> uh, thanks? Sure. And finally, you and Wanup wrote to us about Snap. We spoke extensively last month in an unintentional manner about what was new in the latest version of Snap, the NNTP client for the 2GS, because you had updated it recently, and we were looking through the manual. We couldn't figure out what had changed. It turns out that there were several changes to the program. They are features that were pre-existing but have been enhanced. They're not actually new features. Ewan says that the one person who he knows uses Snap was aware of the changes because I guess he was working with him probably as a tester or at least accepting feature requests. And so it may have seemed redundant to document it. And that seems understandable. 
However, the point I need to take exception with is when Ewan says, most software authors these days do not list every single bug fix. Most updates never have any real change list at all, and they just arrive through one or other of the update methods available. I don't know about that. I, I've certainly noticed that to be true maybe with Firefox and like Firefox plugins, but other things like Mac OS X software updates or WordPress plugins or Carbon Copy Cloner. Granted, none of those are Apple II programs, but they all do tend to come with change logs to let you know what's changing before you install the update. Has that been your experience, Mike? Um, well, every software product that I've ever seen that's been released usually has some sort of indication. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that Ewan is wrong here because I'm certainly not a, a software developer, but it, it seems, at least in my experience, it's, it's been the case more often than not that there's a, a change log uh, with every release regardless of how minor. Yeah, and there are certainly cases where that may not be called for, and Ewan may certainly be speaking of such contexts. But it, it seems especially ironic, given our discussion last month with Michael Mann, our guest, th about documenting one's code and putting in comments and the like, for Ewan to say that most updates aren't documented. Maybe on the Apple II they're not. You know, that's certainly true. I think we're also grateful for any Apple II software, new, enhanced, however, that I would probably install it regardless of whatever I changed. But I'd, it would still leave me curious. Yeah, maybe we can have Ewan on to explain it to us. That is a fantastic idea. And we had a celebrity write in to us as well this month, um, Randy Brandt. He sent an email saying, uh, early in Open Apple podcast number 12, the prize winner wanted more on emulation. Don't we have enough morons in this world already without emulating them? Well, yes, Randy, I think we do. And in the second paragraph, he's a little bit more serious here. Um, as for all the talk of writing AppleSoft code with word processors and spreadsheets to include comments, you can just use Program Writer or Beagle Compiler as they both can strip comments. There were also many REM stripper routines in magazines like Nibble that would allow you to load a program, strip the REMs, and just save a compact version. So we thank Randy for taking the time to send that tip in. Yeah, it probably should have occurred to me. I used Program Writer for the one major AppleSoft basic program I ever wrote, and I don't remember exploring its REM stripping features, but I should have known that there was such a thing. It just makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, I, I remember seeing stuff like that all the time about um, easy techniques for removing comments and things like that. So there you have it, a way to write AppleSoft basic programs that doesn't involve Microsoft Excel, which not everybody has. Uh, we want to thank all our listeners for writing in. It's one way to let us know that you're out there. We certainly do want to be accurate. However... In the last episode alone of this show, we probably talked about a dozen different software and hardware pieces, and we unfortunately just don't have the time or the resources to thoroughly investigate each and every one and try them out hands-on. I mean, we'd certainly love to, but it's just not feasible. Sometimes what we do have to do is get our news secondhand and share it with you, and we regret if that's poor journalism. However, we do have some good news about Open Apple, and that is that if you are looking for our episodes somewhere other than where you're already getting them, you can now find them in the Internet Archive, which is a registered nonprofit online library. Jason Scott has created an easy index in which we can upload all our episodes. And the value of this is not necessarily as an additional distribution or marketing venue, but you know, let's say that Mike and I both get hit by a bus tomorrow. What happens to our podcast? What happens to the library of episodes? Certainly there are people out there like Tony Diaz who are going to suck the site down, but what happens if he can't register the domain before some squatter gets to it? Well, our episodes are still going to be available somewhere, and that link is going to be in the show notes. It's always going to be one episode behind Internet Archives edition, but that is a permanent home for the MP3s. If you still want the show notes you need to come to open-apple.net, but the MP3s will be available forever in the Internet Archive. You know, uh, on a side note here, I think I'm going to get a little bell that we can ring every time Jason Scott's name gets mentioned on one of our podcasts. We can turn it into a drinking game or something. I'm sure I'm sure this is not the, the last time we'll talk about him today. <laughs> we can hope. Last month I mentioned that I had been to the Boston Museum of Science and was dismayed to notice the absence of the Apple II, which was formerly part of their exhibit. You were outraged. Indeed. So I barely contained my rage as I penned an angry email to the Museum of Science. Uh, they were actually quite polite in response. And I didn't hear back in time for the last episode, but now I have heard back. And they say that the Computer Revolution exhibit, which was dismantled in 2010, did include an Apple II, but it was not 
the possession of the Boston Museum of Science. It was on loan from the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, and that is the site to which that Apple II has been returned. I was much relieved to hear this news. I was uh, concerned that this had been the possession of the Museum of Science in Boston and that they had mothballed it or donated it. I knew better than to think that they had just trashed it, but still, when you see an Apple II every year for years in the same place and all of a sudden it's gone, you have... you, you you expect the worst, especially for people who don't recognize the value of an Apple II. So I'm not, I'm glad to know that it went back to a home that recognizes it for what it's worth. Yeah, that's good to hear. Hi, this is Martin Hay. The Open Apple Podcast is so freaking rad. So, Mike, I believe in the value of being patriotic, but I think the Open Apple Podcast in the past year has taken that a little bit to an extreme and been a little bit xenophobic. I agree. Yeah, we need to expand our borders because the Apple II community is global, and we should acknowledge that this month by having on our show the very amazing special guest, Andrew Rowan. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Ken. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Andrew, you've been a listener of our show for a long time, and we're delighted to finally have you on the air. How are you? I'm uh, recovering from the flu, actually, but um, oh dear. Hopefully, hopefully getting better. Well, I hope you didn't catch it from Mike. He had bronchitis during our last episode. Nope, wasn't anywhere near mine. <laughs> You're, in fact, not anywhere near either of us. You are all the way down in which part of Australia are you? I'm in New South Wales in a small town called Sydney. A small town called Sydney. Excellent. And how is it that you came to be an Apple II user in Sydney? Sounds like you're from the area. Yeah, uh, born and raised here. My parents were kind enough to buy me an Apple II Plus for Christmas in 1982 uh, after I was badgering them for an Atari 2600 to play games on. They thought that they could um, improve the, the education of the family by getting a, a computer instead, um, which would allow them to, me to play games and us to find out more about computers, I guess. And um, I started learning basic and pouring through the manuals, and I'm very glad that the Apple was a machine that was open enough to have a programming language built into it that I could get my hands into and learn all about. Playing the games led to wanting to have more games to play, so that led to copying the games and meeting other people. And a teacher decided that uh, he'd like to open up one of the software packages a bit more broadly to more people in the classroom and uh, asked whether we could potentially crack it for him. And that hmm. led to discovering how to deprotect software. And uh, along the way, I learnt assembly language taught myself assembly language and um, one of the ways we communicated those days was via BBS systems so I bought myself a modem and got active in the uh, the local BBS scene. We had eight or nine BBS systems in Sydney that a lot of us would call regularly and participate on. There was one particular one which is a, an online role-playing game, a turn-based game called The Complex run by uh, Sean Craig that a number of us played uh, religiously for a number of years, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember communicating with Sean back when I ran a BBS up here in the uh, in North America. He would actually call my BBS all the way from Australia and try to help me set up the complex or the complex. It's which one is it? The complex. Yeah, the complex. Because it was complex trying to get that up and running. I was using it as a door game on the Warp Six BBS, and he was extremely helpful. He had never seen somebody trying to get up and running in that environment, and he went out of his way to help me try to do so. It seemed like a fantastic game. Yeah, we uh, we really enjoyed the um, the complex version 1 and 2, which were slightly smaller than version 3. Version 1 and 2 had uh, like 20 by 20 grid, which is sort of like a, a wizardry maze that you walked through and discovered as you moved. You'd be able to map the, the locations you went through and run into monsters to, to battle and if you managed to kill them then you'd pick up booty and therefore make your characters stronger. It was um, a lot of fun and as the game turn was uh, based on a day of the week uh, at a certain hour you'd have five or six of us all trying to dial into the system at the same time to be first online. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we got pretty good at uh, doing automatic redials as fast as possible. <laughs> it was a bit of a game between us to see who could get on first. Now, as I recall from when I was in Australia, you don't get free local calling down there like you do up here. So wasn't it rather expensive to be a user of a BBS? Um, th it was not timed calls. It was just a connection fee. So just connecting cost you whatever, 30 cents or something. Um, so it didn't get that expensive if you were you know, making seven calls a week, coming back a week later. Certainly when we started testing Marinetti, for example, uh, with PPP dial-up, 
that got expensive when you're doing half a dozen calls in an hour to test something that's working or not and you can't quite figure out why it's not working and it keeps dropping your call and uh, you have to start again you're redialing and paying another 30 cents it got expensive quite quickly yeah that does add up so you've obviously done some programming having taught yourself assembly uh, do you consider yourself to have a particular genre of software you specialize in, like telecommunications? Because looking at your resume, it looks quite diverse. Yeah, I've had a bit of a dabble in various things, but uh, my keenest interest has been telecommunications, I think, just because you know, it keeps, keeps people interacting and um, it's a good way to... We, we inspired each other down here to, uh, to, to do different things with um, modems and games and communicating. And we didn't really like the software packages that were available weren't open enough for me. So for university project, I decided to write one myself uh, with the help of uh, Richard Bennett. And I learned a lot doing the, the language for that as well. I started on the 2GS quite late compared to some of the other people down here. I still had a 2E and I didn't get 2GS till I was in uni and 90. 91 and uh, by that stage it was sort of the end of its um, its lifeline so from that point on I've been doing little things to improve my experience on the, the 2GS finder based environment and um, uh, helping Richard with a lot of the stuff that he was doing and then finally I took over Marinetti project and I've been focusing on on that I guess in the, the most recent times. Yeah, I think that's probably the project with which you're best associated. Can you tell us how it is that you came to be involved with Marinetti? Well, it started off with Richard wanting some assistance with beta testing um, back in 96. And he approached me to, to help in that regard, and I was quite happy to do so because we'd been working on various things with communication for a while. And I uh, started writing little tools to, to help test it and tried to write a, a newsreader to... Uh, to test it because I was interested in Compsys Apple II since my university days and um, wanted to make sure I could use that on the on the GS. So having a, a local client seemed like a, a good thing to have, but uh, that didn't get very far actually. I I'm not a very good GUI programmer. I'd like to get better at that, but it's something that hasn't happened yet. My user interface wasn't very good, so I stuck to the, the, the back-end type stuff and uh, tried to find some bugs. Um, Richard opened it up to the open source projects in 2000, 2001 while I was uh, overseas traveling, and when I came back, I noticed that you know there'd been a, an initial buzz when that had been released, but nobody had actually done anything with it that I could see, so I just started going about what I needed to do to, to get Marinetti compiling on my own system. So I just sat down and figured out what I needed to do next. And um, eventually I had a, an environment where I could assemble Marinetti and I documented what I did and I put that into the open source project. And eventually Richard released a bit more source code and so I documented what I did to put that into the uh, source code control system on SourceForge and got that assembling in line with all the other stuff and Richard released a little bit more and I put it into CVS and Richard released a little bit more and eventually we had all the source code uh, released and I got it assembling and fixed a few bugs along the way and decided well it's time to make a public release so I worked out what I needed to do to build an installer and documented that and finally we had something I could release at Kansas Fest and I'm still going. There's a few more bugs that have been fixed and uh, people have contributed different things to the Marinetti open source project. For example, the Ethernet link layer was um, contributed by Glenn and Ewan and our friend Kelvin Sherlock released uh, TCP Snooper, which is a CDA that um, shows you what's going on inside the TCP IP stack and it's a fairly useful debugging tool or it thought it would be a useful debugging tool for people to be able to to use and he's released that through the Marinetti open source project so so what is the state of Marinetti now are there bugs you're trying to fix or features you're trying to implement do you have a goal or a deadline or a timeline you're working on I don't have a, a deadline for the next uh, release uh, obviously Kansas Fest rolls around yearly and I'd like to uh, have something to release at about that time however my life is uh, complicated by having a wife and two young children and not having enough sleep and having to do other things like my tax return and it's uh, complicated i got a lot to do <laughs> so so does raising the next generation of apple II users impact the current generation 
It does. It does, yes. So I'd like to have more time to be able to spend on it, um, but it doesn't always happen that way. Now, aside from programming, you've also been quite involved in developing the Apple II community down under, either online with uh, various online chats or offline with your own version of Kansas Fest. Can you tell us more about either of those? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been involved with the Apple Users Group here in Sydney for many years, especially when I started going to university and the uh, the meeting venue was quite close by. Um, I took on the role of editing their publication from the Apple II perspective to provide some content to the main editor, and that went on for six or seven years with a year off while I was travelling. But uh, that continued then to organising the, uh, the people on CSA2 that came from Australia. I thought I'd get them together and have a bit of a chat. So we had a a down under chat that happened on a weekly basis in the A2 Central IRC forum. And uh, then thought, well, you know, having a a weekly chat's great. What about how how about getting together? So a couple of years ago, I decided to make it happen. And uh, with the help of David Wilson and the University of Wollongong, we had a venue and got together and did Mount Kira Fest. I'd like to have another gathering of Apple II folk from Australia. It would be a great thing to to accomplish. Um, I'm not sure when that will happen next. Uh, It sort of depends on people stepping up and saying, hey, I've got something to to talk about potentially, and having a a venue would be be good to to return to. I'm not sure that we can go back to University of Wollongong or not because David Wilson has had a stroke in the meantime and is recovering, and I'm not sure what his capacity is to assist with that so we'll have to find another venue potentially so in the meantime what if that venue is rockers any chance of us getting you back to kansas fest i'd love to come back i've been there at the new venue once uh, or twice um been to the old venue at avila a number of times as well so coming across the across the ditch is certainly something i welcome doing again uh, it's great to get back there and feel the balmy kansas summer <laughs> Almost makes me feel like home coming from from Sydney summers at the moment. It's quite balmy in this room at the moment with the windows closed. Well, it's always been great having you at KFS. I appreciate that you always update us on where Marinetti is going because there are so many places for Apple II news online that sometimes it it can get lost in all the static. But having the person responsible stand right in front of us and tell us what's happening, that's that's great. And you've even done that remotely, aren't there? Haven't there been times that you've collaborated with either Tony Diaz or Ryan Suinaga to present remotely at KFS? Yeah, I did one attempt at that uh, by sending through a PowerPoint presentation for displaying locally while I spoke over Skype, I think it was, to um, to communicate with the people in the room. Um, that worked okay, but there, there is a big lag, um, especially over the, um, the Rockhurst network. It was a bit of a delay and it wasn't the best experience, but uh, certainly can do that sort of thing again, um, I wouldn't hesitate to do that if I've got something good to tell you. Well, if you want to come to KFS in person, is there a way that we can help you do that? Sure. Um, look, I've got uh, some United Frequent Flyer miles sitting in an account, and I haven't got quite enough to get back over there. But if anybody would like to donate some to me, I'm quite happy to take them from you and use that to uh, to get over to KFS again. Consider it a bit of a Kickstarter and donate some miles to me, and I'll... Um, <laughs> I'll come up with something to present when I get there. I just won't be showing up. Say, right, because if you show up to KFest without something to show off, you suck. Indeed. Indeed. So how would people get in touch with you to help you with that? And I'm sure there'll be a link in the show notes to uh, send me an email. Get what's new and exciting in retro computing with two news. Well, we have conventions in the news, but not the ones you may be expecting. They just announced in the past day or two the keynote speaker for PAX East. PAX is the Penny Arcade Expo, which was launched about a decade ago in Seattle, Washington, and which in the year 2010 expanded into an East Coast edition in the United States with an annual event in Boston. This is aimed at gamers of all sorts. Computer gamers, video gamers, board gamers. And this year's keynote speaker is of particular interest to Apple II users, that being Jordan Mechner, creator of Karateka and Prince of Persia, the classic video game franchises that launched on the Apple II back in the 80s. That would be Karateka, Ken. 
You know, I've heard Karataka, I've heard Karatika, and just recently Wade Clark sent me a video interview with Joran Meshner where he pronounced it. Karateka, actually, is what it sounded like he said. Mike, did you grow up with either of these games? Uh, I played it a lot. I always called it uh, Karataka. Mm -hmm. Andrew, are you a fan of either of these franchises? I really enjoyed my time playing Karataka. Um, I got to the end and got kicked in the face by the by the girl and didn't know, didn't know <laughs> what I'd done wrong. And uh... Best Easter egg ever. And wasn't there an Easter egg if you put the floppy disk in upside down? That would mean that you'd actually have the original disk, and I never did. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> you were playing it at a friend's house, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you flip the disk over, the, the game plays upside down. Or, in Australia's case, right side up. Well, Joran Meshner will be the keynote speaker, and he follows a long line of keynote speakers that most famously includes Will Wheaton as being the star attraction of former PAX East and PAX Prime. I'm not sure what Joran Meshner will be speaking about this year. I haven't actually seen the news online. This was emailed to me directly by my friend Phil Cheatham, who's going to be one of the PAX enforcers this year. But I'm definitely looking forward to being in the audience for this presentation. Juice GS Associate Editor Andy Malloy will be there, and we're hoping that Kansas Fest alumnus Wayne Arthurton will also be there in the audience. So maybe we'll get some vintage copies of Jordan Messner's works autographed and then put on eBay for outrageous prices because they're rare, rare, rare. Now, Mike, I assume you've seen the other news that Messner has made headlines for in the past week or two. Uh, yes, Ken, actually I have. It, it seems that uh, Jordan is actually rebooting Karatika for consoles. This seems to be a great time for an Apple II user to be a modern-day gamer because there are so many games that have come out. There's been Load Runner for the Xbox 360. Just last month, there was Choplifter HD also for the 360. And, of course, there's Prince of Persia, which you can get the classic version of on, again, Xbox 360. And it's many reboots and reimaginings and remakes for a variety of consoles and systems. Jordan says that this reboot that he's now working on is actually the first game he's had his he's had direct involvement in since 2003 everything since then has been graphic novels film adaptations and the other entries in the prince of persia franchise so it's interesting to hear that he's getting back to his roots but i'm wondering how much can he do with karatika how much can he do with that because prince of persia it had a plot it had a princess it had a villain and i i guess his original rotoscope action game sort of has those things as well, but it just seems, by comparison, a bit more superficial. Well, you know, a 3D rotoscope version, live action actors with 360-degree uh, panning around the uh, the actors as they, they take the hits. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to see that. <laughs> but what you just described sounds like so many other games that are being made nowadays. I, I hope he can do something that refers back to the game's roots while still being modern and unique. Well, he did a really good job with that, uh, with um, the Prince of Persia reboot in 2003 with Sands of Time. Um, I, I think there were a lot of the same questions because, you know, previously Prince of Persia had been kind of the side-scrolling thing, and, and uh, they really did a great job of taking advantage of, of new hardware and the 3D environments that you could create with that and, and still, I think, remain in the spirit of, of the original. If anyone can do it, I think he can. I wonder what sort of Easter eggs it might have. I love it when remakes of old games have the original game as a hidden feature. I don't think they did that with most of the new versions of Prince of Persia. I can see Karatika easily fitting into an Xbox 360 disc, but this is actually going to be a downloadable game for the 360 and the PlayStation 3, so there might not be much room because they only have like 500 meg megabytes maybe to work with. Well, you know, they can they fit uh, Zork into Call of Duty, so I'm sure that they can put the original Karatek into this one. That's true. Well, I don't know if I'll get close enough to the game's creator at PAX East, but I am much more looking forward to uh, the more community-oriented aspect of Kansas Fest, which I am told will actually be opening its registration soon. We are recording this show on February 25th, and I have it from inside sources who... Uh, have approved this dissemination of the news that registration may open as early as March 1st and maybe as late as March 7th. And either of those dates might slip based on what may or may not happen behind the scenes. But with any luck, in the next week, you'll be able to hand your money over and secure a spot at Rockhurst for this July 17th to the 22nd. 
Now, Andrew, we mentioned you probably won't be able to make it again this year. Mike, you're going for sure, right? Uh, well, if I don't, you're in trouble. <laughs> That's right, because we have coordinated some travel plans. Yes, we have. That's right. I'm gonna gonna be swinging through Denver and saying hi, and then hightailing our way across the plains of Kansas together. Yeah, last year you rode back to Denver afterwards, and this time you're riding out. That's right. So I guess over the course of a year, I get a round trip. Kansas Fest is also expanding their online video presence. In the past two years, we've had many videos uploaded to the video service Vimeo, which is an alternative to YouTube. Probably over 40 videos now exist there. For anybody who hasn't attended Kansas Fest before, they can watch the sessions and the presentations, even some of the contests and games that have been held at KFest. Uh, as of this week, those same videos are now also available on the Internet Archive, which is an online nonprofit library. They are available through an iTunes uh, video podcast feed that you can subscribe to. And I think they may even be coming to YouTube as well, because YouTube originally used to have a 10-minute limit on videos, but accounts in good standing can now upload videos of almost any length, which is why there's a three-hour version of NyanCat. Three hours? Yeah, the original three minutes wasn't really enough, and so there's now three hours, if not more. I'll just put that in a loop and play it over the PA at work. <laughs> She'll be everybody's new best friend. <laughs> I certainly will. Now, Andrew, have you watched any of the videos or listened to any of the audio podcasts, such as keynote speakers that you weren't able to attend in person, like Mark Simonson or Bob Bishop or Jason Scott? I have been rather lax in catching up, um, unfortunately. I've, I'm a an avid reader of reports uh, because they come out almost immediately after the the event, but the podcasts and videos lag somewhat and uh, going back to them at that later time and catching up. You'd think I'd I'd be right on top of that, but I I haven't been. I'll put it on my list of things to do. Yeah, you are correct that there is a significant delay between the event and the videos of the event becoming available. The keynote speech, we usually try to get up pretty quickly, but we're not always successful. I know the videos can be hard to watch because it takes some dedication to sit down and find the time to watch a video for an hour or two. That's why I prefer the audio podcast, which you can just throw on your MP3 player and listen to as you go for a jog or a drive to work. But I also know a lot of KFest sessions have a heavy visual component, and if you just reduce it to an audio podcast, you don't always get the same effect. Yeah, I would love to uh, be there in person, obviously, and uh, the next best thing would be catching up on the, the video and audio that's been made available. I thank you very much for, for, for putting it up there, but um, to date, I haven't watched everything that's available yet. I should get back there. Thanks for the reminder. Now, I, I would like to get an opinion from each of you. The videos that you watch online, when you're streaming, it may or may not matter how big the resolution is or how large the file is because it's just streaming over your web browser. Maybe it matters more when you're downloading it directly to your computer through iTunes, such as to put on your iPod. So if you, if you were going to watch like a, a one-hour video of a KFS session through iTunes, how big a file would you be willing to download? I mean, what sort of resolution do you need? I mean, what what are your expectations for what's good to get an hour of video out of? Well, I guess it depends on um, on the presentation. You know, I if it's if it's mostly somebody talking, then I don't really care that much. I can you know I might glance over at the video while doing other things, but um, if if it's a something where I'm getting a visual demonstration of a, a new product and how it's working, then resolution becomes more important to me. Um, size, the size of the video doesn't actually matter that much to me. I, I've got fairly quick internet here, so it doesn't take too long to download even a, a very large file. Uh, and usually I don't, once I've watched it, then I'll delete the file, and if I need to see it again, I can go get it online somewhere. Because obviously if the file is big and you're putting it onto a 16 gigabyte iPod, that's going to be a significant dedication of space. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't download files, video files like that directly to my iPad or anything. I have, um, I have a streaming application that streams the videos from my desktop to the iPad. I see. And what's the name of that application? It's called Air Server. Oh, I think I've heard of that. They do AirPlay as well. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's, that's the same thing or not. Oh, I, I'm sorry. AirPlay is the name of Apple's feature that allows you to stream video from one to the other. But I do think I've heard of that company. They do some other similar products. Uh, what about you, Andrew? What what sort of expectations do you have when being presented with a one-hour video? I'd like to, as Mike suggested, be able to see what's on the on the screen if that's important. 
perhaps in future you might be able to record uh, the video feed directly that's going to the screen as well and then you've got the option to to cut and from the video camera to the actual video feed to improve the experience perhaps for, for viewers yeah I really like that idea so, so you're not crazy about what's currently done which is the video is made available unadulterated and then separately there's the keynote or PowerPoint file that Look, was used I'm happy to get it however however it arrives as long as I can see what's on the screen if that's important I'll, I'll be happy in terms of size, um, I've got a 10 gig per month limit, so as long as it doesn't go over 10 gigs, I'm, um, I'm happy. <laughs> so having to download, say, like a 1 gigabyte file, that's 10% of your monthly allocation. That's a lot to expect. Yeah, although you know, I do that occasionally for um, other video, and I can grab the Kansas Fest content over a couple of months during the year, potentially, if I need to. And it's something I'd do if, uh, if I was keen about looking at the, the video content but you know i might listen to the audio first and then decide whether or not to look at the video i think ideally it would it would be great to be able to watch the presentation like in powerpoint or in in uh, keynote and then have the audio uh, narration over that but i don't know if that's even within the realm of possibility for what you're thinking about no it's, it's definitely possible i've i did sign similar when i uploaded this past summer's kansas fest roast when i made that available that cut back and forth between the screen and the the speaker but that requires more investment of time and energy into the post-production editing and since there's already a delay in getting these videos out i'm not sure how much more it wants to be delayed obviously a quality product is worth waiting for but at the same time there's just so much to be done and very often so little time in which to do it all right well sorry to have uh, spent so much time on that it was just something i was curious about so some information and feedback that will help the kfs committee moving forward I want to very briefly mention another upcoming History of Computing event, which I mentioned last month, which is Game Fest at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They are opening the Art of Video Games. I have mentioned that I might be going, and I now definitely am going. I'll be seeing Jeff Weiss while I'm in the area, and also Seth and Michelle Sternberger, who together compose the music group 8-Bit Weapon. Michelle may also be known in for her solo work under the alias Computer. I've spoken with them many times over the years, used their software, interviewed them for JuiceGS. Looking forward to finally hearing them play live and meeting with them. And again, I'm going to extend the invitation that they come perform live one day at Kansas Fest. Don't know if we'll ever get them there, but we can hope. You know who's contributed significantly to the history of video games is Tim Schaefer of Double Fine Productions. Are either of you familiar with his work? Never heard of it. Familiar with it either. Huh. Now, Mike, you have a... Penchant for being sarcastic. Are you being sincere this time? Uh, actually, I am being sincere. I've never heard of Double Fine. Uh, okay. If you haven't heard of Tim Schafer, how about his buddy Ron Gilbert? Nope. Hmm. Well, Tim Schafer has created some games you may have heard of. Very often, even nowadays, it's more often the software that's better known than the geniuses behind them. Uh, some names include uh, Psychonauts, Grim Fandango, The Secret of Monkey Island, and Day of the Tentacle. Any of those ring a bell? Grim Fandango and what was the Monkey Island one? The Secret of Monkey Island. Yeah, I've heard those titles, but I've never played any of those games. Did I? Huh. Well, Day of the Tentacle is the sequel to Maniac Mansion. Am I getting any closer to home yet? That I've heard of, yes. Yeah, Maniac Mansion and a couple of the other games were available for the Apple II. Tim Schafer is still in the video games industry, making a variety of best-selling games. Most recently, he tried his hand at children's game, including... Once Upon a Monster, which is a Sesame Street game. Uh, anyway, he wants to get back to his roots and create a adventure game, just like in the old days of Maniac Mansion. He knows that if he went to a publisher nowadays and said, hey, I want to make an adventure game, they'd be like, ah, that genre's dead. Go away. But he's Tim Schafer. He has reputation in this industry. So he went on Kickstarter and said, I want $400,000. 300000 for my company Double Fine to make a new point-and-click adventure game. 100000 to document the game-making process that even if the end result isn't good, you still have a documentary about the process. $400,000 on Kickstarter is a lot. He set himself the generous goal of 30 days to make that much money. He hit his goal in eight hours. Oh, my goodness. By the end of the first 24 hours, he'd raised a million dollars. Wow. And by the end of the first weekend, he had two million dollars. So Double Fine is on the hook to make an amazing game. <laughs> I almost feel bad for these guys. That's going to be a lot of pressure. It's only a thousand bucks for me to get to K-Fest. 
See, you should do that Kickstarter. I go to these same people. Hey, you got two million bucks. What's a thousand? Come on. What's in it for them? That's what's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. A lot of the donations to the Double Fine Kickstarter came from people who wanted to pre-order the game because it was a very small amount of money that uh, I think 15 bucks gets you the game, 25 bucks gets you the game and the documentary. So if you're going to buy the game anyway when it comes out, this is basically a pre-order. Uh, but it's just amazing the uh, the kind of projects that have been realized through Kickstarter and also the opportunity that crowdfunding has to redefine an industry. I mean, if Double Fine can do it, what other luminaries can do it? I mean, imagine if Joran Meshner wanted to go recreate another franchise and he just wanted to cut out the publisher entirely. I mean, he may need the publisher in the end because they have marketing and reach, but as far as the initial capital goes, he wouldn't be beholden to whatever is the current market trend. He could make whatever kind of game he wants based on his name because people recognize him and would support him in whatever endeavor he makes. That's kind of an amazing potential. It does, yeah. I've, I've been amazed at the, uh, the kind of projects you've been discussing on Kickstarter and the fact that they get uh, their funding so quickly. It's, it's, a, it's a great medium to, uh, to open up new possibilities. And it looks like other classic game developers might be taking a cue from Tim Schafer. Brian Fargo, who was with Interplay and was the father of the original Wasteland game, uh, has announced his intention to possibly remake Wasteland. I don't think he's nearly as far into the planning stages as maybe uh, Mermeshner is with uh, Karatika, but he's planning to fund this through Kickstarter, um, since we were talking about that. Uh, He said he'd only thought about it. It only took him a couple of hours uh, of consideration to actually decide that he wants to do this. So I think that would be neat. Uh, Again, this comes down to I wonder what something like that's going to look like and how well it will translate in today's 3D first-person shooter sort of environment. Well, won't it basically look like its spiritual successor, Fallout? I mean, haven't we basically already had a Wasteland sequel? Uh, If he chooses to go the 3D route, yeah, I I think there was some indication that he might try to make it look more like the the original top-down experience. Fargo said that uh, he would be focusing on, actually, yeah, he'll be focusing on top-down, probably isometric, party-based, skill-based game, so that if you just finished playing the original Wasteland and moved into this, you'd feel completely comfortable. Uh, He wants to make it a PC game first, but he says that iOS is not out of the question. So you could even be playing uh, a Wasteland on your iPad. What about my Apple II? Probably not, no. Ah. Of course, you could just play the original on your Apple II. (laughs) That's true. If you want to play Wasteland, go play wasteland (laughs) now i actually have never played wasteland or fallout have either of you i have not um the original wasteland was one of my favorite games and i played the the first uh first two fallout games when they were kind of more the top down turn-based movement sort of a thing Uh, i did not play fallout 3 i bought the game and it was buggy and kept crashing to the desktop and i Figured, well, I'll just wait for patches, and the patches eventually came, but at that point I kind of lost interest. So maybe I'll go back to it someday. Wasn't there a text adventure that focused on a nuclear bomb going off? Does that sound familiar? Uh, Infocom made a game called Trinity. That's it, exactly. But definitely no relation to Wasteland. No. I don't know why I confuse those two. They're completely different, and maybe because I haven't played either one, but... Trinity, I think, was more historical fiction based on the actual uh, atom bomb testing that took place in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. And actually, I think the name Trinity comes from the first ever nuclear weapon test that the United States performed on July 16, 1945. That was called Trinity. That would be it. One of my favorite Apple II game developers recently released a non-game utility, not for the Apple II, but of interest to Apple II users. I had a quick look at Shrinkfit X when I was given a uh, a beta version of of it that runs on OS 10.5. I wrote to to Kelvin and said, "Hey mate, I saw your recent uh, release and was very pleased to see it, but hey, can you make it run on 10.5?" <laughs> and he wrote back and said uh, his number one feedback had been for a version to run on 10.5 and his number two feedback had been for a version to run on 10.4 he included uh, a beta for for me to to try out and I ran it on 10.5 and opened up an archive and extracted something but it's still a beta so hopefully we'll see something soon so the version of ShrinkFit X that's currently in the Mac App Store is only for Snow Leopard and later? yeah 
So ShrinkFit X, for those who haven't tried it yet, is a Mac OS X utility that is absolutely free from the Mac App Store by Kelvin Sherlock of G. Shizen fame and Open Apple fame. And it allows you to open and extract a variety of Shrinkit files, which historically has been difficult, if not impossible, to do. There's been a command line utility called uh, Nufix that has done it for you, but the interface, obviously, it can be challenging for people who are used to the GUI environment of Mac OS X. Now you can do it for absolutely free. The utility came out on February 2nd. It's only 1.4 megabytes. And as we said, it requires 10.6 or later. So I highly recommend you check it out. He had sent me a uh, preview edition earlier, and I was just floored because... It's so simple and so elegant, which is exactly what it needs to be because opening Shrinkit files is just a quick process, or at least it should be, and historically it hasn't been on the Mac. So I'm really glad to see him bring this, and it's a great compliment to Profuse, which is the file system translator he previously released that allows ProDOS volumes to be mounted directly on the Mac desktop in a read-only state. It always amazes me when people like Kelvin or you, Andrew, who are just able to work in so many different genres. I mean, Kelvin in the Kansas Fest community gained his fame through G. Shizen, which is a game. And now he's writing, you know, like iOS apps and Mac utilities that deal with file system translators. And it's so different from G. Shizen. And even you, Andrew, I mentioned that your focus seems to be telecommunications, but you've written uh, DOS Launcher and the Share Clip utility. And granted, that has a telecommunications aspect to it, but they're all just so different. And I, I love that because it means I never know what you're going to do next. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the sentiment behind that, but I have to correct you a little bit. The uh, DOS 3.3 Launcher is not actually written by me. It's uh, written by John McLean. I just took over the source code for it and corrected a few bugs and enhanced it a little bit. But, um, yeah, I, I think it comes down to we look at stuff that we think would be nice for us to have in our environment and we, we fiddle away and we get something working and we release it and then, you know, we find lots of other people have great benefit in it as well. So, you know, it comes from, from learning ourselves and extending ourselves a little bit, a little bit and seeing what happens. I wonder what... Why it took so long to, for a utility like this to show up on Mac OS, other than maybe there was just Kelvin was the one who was interested and so he did it because, ironically, you could do this on Windows through Cider Press and you've been able to do that for for many many years now. And I'm looking forward to maybe seeing it uh, this utility developed into something that that more resembles or or offers similar functionality to what you could get in Cider Press. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Kelvin, having already written Profuse and now ShrinkFit X continued to develop discrete utilities that accomplished dedicated tasks and then maybe eventually collected them all into one massive utility, kind of like Apple Commander does with disk images. I know that ShrinkFit X is free because its underlying base, the new fix utility, is, which is what it relies on, is free. So Kelvin didn't feel right charging for it. But his other utilities are definitely worth, even in today's smallish Apple II community, they deserve to be paid for. But you're right, Mike. It's strange that you would expect there to be more Apple II emulators and Apple II users on the Mac, people who have stuck with the brand and are familiar with the design philosophy to a degree, as opposed to on Windows, and yet Windows has Cider Press, which is just amazing. There definitely needs to be more balance there. So Kelvin needs to get on that. <laughs> right, because he's not doing enough. That's right. As opposed to the rest of us. <laughs> Mike, you know, that program you released last month, that was great. Thanks, Ken. I'm glad you like it. I can't wait to see your next program next month and another one after that. Well, I'll have one out next week. Oh, boy. Uh, speaking of prolific programmers, or at least once upon a time, Andrew, I believe another one of your mates has been making headlines recently with some reclassifications. Yeah, Kim Howe has uh, come back onto the scene. He's um, been showing up in the A2 Central IRC chat room and uh, saying he's progressing on writing some new software, which is great to see. And uh, came out with an announcement recently that he's reclassifying his all his Apple IIGS programs that he's written before. And that's uh, it's great to see he's uh, back in, involved with the community again. It looks like his software library includes... Arachnid, which is a GUI web browser for TCP IP. There's Shipwrecked, which is a an adventure game based on HyperCard. Yahtzee, the classic dice rolling game, this time in a new desk accessory format. And a Telnet NDA, which is a Telnet NDA. Any of you use any of these programs? I unfortunately have not, actually. I've looked at Arachnid, obviously, being a Marinetti-capable application. I've 
um, quite keen to see what other people do with, with marinating, and I've looked at arachnid in the past. Um, it uh, has potential, but needs a fair bit of work to uh, to bring it up to any usable standard in, in today's internet browsing client. Yeah, he, he calls it Arachnid Preview 3, so I assume that this is sort of an open beta? Yeah. Um, next up, we have the uh, brief reintroduction of the Ethernet card for Apple II users. Uh, this, of course, is the, the Ethernet card for Apple II users, and um, every couple of years, A2 Retro Systems puts up another run of cards, and as always, they sell out very quickly. And I think this time, the pre-order run for 45 cards sold out in less than 48 hours. So if you didn't get one in time, then um, I guess you can cross your fingers and hope that they release more soon. Well, it's a great enabling technology uh, to be able to communicate network your machine, whether or not you've got Marinetti or Contiki. I think people are interested in getting some transfer happening a bit faster over the Ethernet protocol, and it's a, it's a great product. It's very well implemented and uh, got great support by Glenn. I'm, I'm personally... Very surprised to see the the low numbers that he was putting into this this run. I thought 48 cards was you know I'm not surprised that they've sold out so quickly. Uh, I think there's some pent up demand there, and uh, they should take advantage of it. Yes, I was surprised because knowing that these cards always sell out, it would seem more logical and probably more affordable for him to order a run of 100 cards as opposed to 50. Then again, I imagine he has a waiting list, so he probably has a better idea what the demand was than we do. I assume all of us already have our Ethernet cards. I have one. Yeah, I, I had one of my two GS, and I actually ordered one from this run for for my two E. Has it arrived? Uh, not yet. I think these were pre-orders, so I don't know if they're shipping yet. He didn't offer you an ETA. Uh, nope. In fact, I got nothing at all. <laughs> what do you mean? Like not even a confirmation email or anything? Nope. All I got was the receipt from PayPal that I had paid, um, but I, I haven't heard anything since. Hmm. So I hope it. I hope he actually got my order. I'm sure he did. And, you know, you have the receipt to prove it. And yeah. uh, if he didn't get your order, and, you know, one nice thing about dealing with somebody like Len is that if a mistake occurs, we know it's just a mistake and not somebody trying to run off with your money. Right, absolutely. Fortunately, I've regularly missed the opportunity to buy an Ulanet card directly from Glenn, and I was on his waiting list. But uh, one year, Sean Fahey generously sold me one at Kansas Fest, beating Glenn, so I was able to take myself off the way and listen, make that one available to somebody else. And now I have one in my Apple II that Peter Neubauer encouraged me to finally get up and running, and I use it to zap files back and forth with ADT Pro. Nice. Uh, next up, we have uh, Pascal on the iPad. I'm bringing this up now just because I recently discovered it. Uh, this was actually released last year, and the guy that's doing this has released several languages, but I know that Pascal was um, an important development language for the Apple II platform for many years. And so if uh, and I've been playing around with it, and it's, it's a really good way to, to learn some easy Pascal techniques. And it's selling for $1.99, so at that price, I mean... It's definitely worth checking out, or at least it was for me. Oh, so you've actually so you bought this app? Do you are you finding it useful? I am. Yeah, it's it's helpful because it comes with um, a couple of pre-built programs that you can play with, and you can see the source code. And switching back and forth between uh, writing and compiling and running is pretty easy. And because you have the the speed of the the A4 chip in the iPad, uh, compiling is is a, a snap. That happens real quick. Uh, and the developer, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce, he's also made available Basic, uh, a version of Basic. It looks like Visual Basic and C++ and Objective C and Java. So if you're looking to play around with some programming languages on the iPad, that's probably a good way to go. Now, how much of what you think you're learning from the Pascal app on the iOS? will be translatable to the Apple II and Apple III? Probably more the techniques than the actual language, although uh, it doesn't say which version of Pascal this is compatible with. Because wasn't Pascal the language you are going to use for your retro challenge? It is, yeah. Uh, Andrew, what languages do you program in when you're on the Apple II GS? Uh, primarily Merlin Assembler, although I have dabbled in Orca C, but yeah, Merlin Assembler is my primary language. So is it true what I've been told, that Pascal is a good learning language but not a good production language? I think that Pascal has a bit of that, what's the word, um, it's got that type of feeling to it, but on the Apple IIgs, uh, Pascal is a very solid language, and in fact, Mike used uh, Pascal to program Orca C. 
So Pascal is as solid as any other language. And with the toolbox interfaces, uh, I think it's much of a muchness what you can achieve uh, at a high level with, the, with these languages on the Apple IIgs. So I haven't heard many mentions of Pascal being used on the Apple II. I think Ryan Suinaga might have used it for some of his programs, and I think I had a Mahjong program for the 2GS that was written in Pascal, and there may have been a version of Load Runner or not, but I don't know of many other people who have used it, but then again, I don't know that I necessarily would pay attention to what language is being used behind the scenes as long as the end product works. Yeah, exactly, and uh, I think it's going to be difficult to pick the language um, from looking at the end product. And you know, people use what they're most comfortable with programming in themselves. And, you know, as you mentioned, Ryan used Pascal. Kelvin would probably use C. And you would use Assembler. And I would probably use a Spectrum script because Spectrum already does that. It's really cool to see people continuing to find uses for the Apple II, which brings us to our next news story. One of our listeners, A.M., recently sent us a link to a story that was published on PC World by Benj Edwards, who's written a lot of stories for a lot of outlets, including Technologizer, about retro computing. He's a great asset to our community. This story is about old computers that are still in use in commercial or professional environments today. And one of the stories is by Kevin Huffman, who works in Eden, North Carolina, and does all his finances on his Apple IIe. He does have a modern computer that he uses for word processing, email, and web browsing. But when it comes to accounting, he still relies on the business accountant, which is by Manzanita Software, which came up with an Apple II in 1984. So he's not even using AppleWorks or one of the other well-known accounting or spreadsheet programs. He's using this one, which I'm not familiar with. It's amazing that some diehards are still out there, still using Apple IIs. Who are these people? You know, actually, I think, Andrew, it was when I was in Australia, maybe in Brisbane, that I was walking through the mall and I saw a fortune-telling kiosk, just a little machine set up in the corridor, where you put a quarter in and you give it some basic information like your name and birthday, and it spits out your horoscope. And there was a, a slight crack in the case in which I could peek in and see the machine that was running it, and I'm pretty sure it was some sort of an Apple II. Yeah, I've seen those as well. We have a number of fairs around the country, and one of them was an Easter show in Sydney, I think, and Big Sideshow Alley, and Fortune Teller, come and get your fortune here, or Signature Interpretation, or something like that, and uh, they were just printing out stuff off, a, off an Apple II um, <laughs> in exchange for your, for your, your, your dollar. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you saw one of those? Oh, it's been many years now. Yeah, it's been 12 years since I was in Brisbane. Do either of you encounter other scenarios where you're... Surprised to see an Apple II still being used? I haven't seen one no. in use for a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah, me either. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly heard stories of them, such as a uh, company I think called Superior Watch Service in New York City, which recently switched from the Apple II. That was originally featured in the AppleWorks forum, the scan of which you can get off your website, Mike. But yeah, Apple IIs, uh, PDPs, and other computers, such as those featured in Benj's article for PC World, are definitely becoming rarer. And it's a little scary. Like, I just saw a documentary last week about linotype machines and all these different print houses that still use them. And there is a guy who travels around the country repairing these aging machines. But one thing that the documentary didn't address was where does he get the parts for them? Because Linotype was actually a trademark name by a specific company. So this is a brand that is no longer being made. So, you know, when, when an Apple II, not just an Apple II, but like a PDP, let's say a PDP fails nowadays, how do you fix it? I guess you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, while you're... Uh... Learning Pascal on your iPad, you might like to uh, get some inspiration from Lim Tai Chin's new book. He's released a, a book for Apple IIgs Programming for Kids. It's a multi-touch book. It's got some videos included. And there's plenty of complete Pascal, Orca Pascal, and GSoft basic source code included. Oh, that's cool. I'll have to check that out. Unfortunately, you need an iPad with iBooks 2 app, but um, if you've got the requirements, I'm sure that's a neat resource to have. Well, that'll make it worth upgrading to iBooks, too. And that's a free upgrade, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I was able to download the book and add it to my iTunes library on my Snow Leopard machine, but to actually open the book and read it requires an iPad, which I don't have. So 
I think it's really fascinating that there's this desire to consume all this classic Apple II media on the new devices. We've talked previously on this show about how the iPad is just a great device to hold all the PDFs that you've scanned, Mike. But yeah, just all the material that's on your site and now all the material that's on Steve Weirich's site. He's working on creating an ebook and also a, a printed book based on the history of the Apple II that he has compiled over the last 21 years at uh, appletohistory.org. His foremost goal, I believe, is a print book, and he was working on an ebook using the iBooks Author application for Lion. Unfortunately, iBooks Author has a strange oversight that you would not expect to find from a utility designed to create textbooks, which is that it does not support footnotes, which Steve uses extensively throughout his website. So until there's an effective way to implement footnotes in an ebook, it almost doesn't seem worth it. Yeah, that's kind of odd. I will say that it's nice to see all of these publications, you know, Apple II history sort of publications finally coming out. You've got a, a lot of books and, and movies and documentaries on the history of the Macintosh, but uh, less so on the Apple II. Well, I think Jason Scott said that he's coming to Kansas Fest 2012 and bringing his video equipment. Uh, I think that's for his 6502 documentary. You know, I'll bet you that's a good chunk of what he's coming for, but I have known Jason to put out these two to three minute documentaries about other material. For example, there's an art exhibit in New York City and the creator said that it's a hard thing to market because you have to experience it. You can't show it to somebody. And Jason said, I take that as a challenge. So he went up there with his camera and he shot a nice little, you know, like a three minute trailer of this thing. And if he were to create a Kansas Fest trailer, I would not complain. So I was browsing the old Compsys Apple II the other day, and uh, there was a post from Antoine, uh, a brutal deluxe, about a man named Carl Grabe, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, who worked at uh, Apple Computer uh, from 1983 to 98. He started at uh, Apple Computer Cork, which is in Ireland, and then in 85 he was transferred from there to Cupertino, and he worked on the, the 2GS and became the lead for the machine ROM diagnostics team. And he put up a web page uh, of some of his work uh, on the Cortland project, which of course later on became the 2GS. Uh, right now, there's a a bunch of photos that he took, uh, the various some of the various equipment that he worked on. Um, not a whole lot there for actual documentation or anything like that, but uh, he says more is coming, and the pictures are definitely cool to browse through. Look forward to checking it out. Yeah. And just this morning, in fact, a website called Neat Designs, which I think is a, a marketing, it's a, a blog aimed at marketing types and advertising, posted an article of its 80 vintage Apple ads. It starts with the Apple One and goes all the way through 1999. So you're talking up through the iMac and, and that era. The article, the article's okay, but it's mostly about the, the ads. And I was browsing through some of there, some of them, and it's fun to kind of reminisce about ads that I had forgotten about, and there were even a few in there that I hadn't seen before. So that was neat. Uh, it starts out with the the ad for for the Mission Impossible movie that was released in '96 with Tom Cruise, and there was Apple invested heavily in that, and of course their products are spread out through that movie. I had completely forgotten about that. Yeah, and and that's kind of like for me too. As I'm, as I'm browsing through there, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, there, there's the first ad for the Apple IIgs in 1986, which doesn't actually mention Apple IIgs except in very small text at the bottom of the second page, um, which kind of I think gives you an idea of how they felt about the IIgs there. Yeah, funny that they would take out a full page ad and then not make the product's name more prominent. Right. Uh, I oh yeah, and they they have some of those what's on your PowerBook ads where they would interview famous people who used Apple PowerBooks at the time. And I have a hard time looking at those now without laughing because there's a parody ad that was released and I can't find it anymore, but there's a parody ad that was released about the PowerBook 5300, which was the one that that caught on fire. Um and somebody put what's on your PowerBook and it was a picture of one of these smoking 5300s with some sausages and some bacon and it says I'm cooking up breakfast on mine. <laughs> Apple, it's what's for dinner. That's right. Back in, in the days of the, the Power Mac, G3 era, 97, 98, they, they had some funny ads. I always enjoyed the sense of humor in those. One of them says, uh, absolute power corrupts. Enjoy. <laughs> and if our loyal listeners have been listening to us for this far into this episode, then I don't think we have to worry about them running to our competition because there's a new kid on the block. Who's that, Ken? Why don't you tell us, Mike? I haven't actually listened to it. Uh, so David Grealish has, has released another uh, podcast. This is the... Another podcast, uh, not another, another one. Not another Apple podcast. In fact, that's the name of it. 
So technically, wouldn't that make it the Not Another Apple Podcast podcast? Yes, but it's not the, or is it the Not Another Apple Podcast podcast? Well, you know, this is, you could call this Open Apple, but you wouldn't say it's Open Apple Podcast. You'd say it's the Open Apple Podcast. That's true. So the Not Another Apple Podcast podcast. I'm so confused. <laughs> well, he has so many podcasts already. What's one more? All right. Uh, so this one is with uh, David and Blake Patterson of Bite Seller. And... Oh, you mean Blake. Oh, <laughs> yes, I mean Blake. That Blake. And in it, they promise to bring a, a mix of retro and current Apple topics. The first episode I, I had a chance to listen to, and it lasted for about 90 minutes, and, and David and Blake discussed uh, Apple retail stores and, and Apple retailing in general. I think both of them worked at uh, retailers for Apple back in the day, and so that, that provided a topic of conversation for them. It'll be interesting to see how the show evolves over time because you know I don't go to an Apple store every week, although I know there are some who do, and Apple doesn't release new products every other week, which is this podcast for publication frequency. So I, I'm I, knowing David, he'll find a, a way to keep it interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing what that might be. Yeah, me too. Uh, quick question. Andrew, have you listened to the Not Another Apple podcast podcast? No, I have not. I, um, I'm a loyal listener of Open Apple. What's it worth to you? Hold on to your wallet as we look at the latest Apple pickings. Before we get into this month's eBay auctions, there's one we mentioned a couple of months ago, which I think our guest might have some insight into. Yeah, Ken, I um, was interested in that uh, really expensive auction for a collection of Apple II gear in, in Australia. You might remember the one that Mike found for initially $69,000 and then the a buy it now of $75,000 for an entire collection. Yeah, look, I was uh, close enough to the guy to actually be intrigued as to what he possibly on earth could have had that would be worth that much. And uh, so I contacted him and I asked a few questions and tried to ascertain what it is that he, that he had without actually going to the expense of traveling out to his, to his place to, ha to have a look. I got together with a, a friend of mine um, and we made him an offer, um, which was, compared to the price he was asking, it was a fairly low-ball offer. But, you know, it was a genuine one from us. We were happy to take whatever he had off his hands uh, if he was in distress and wanted to get rid of it. And uh, we would break it up and take what we wanted and put back on eBay in smaller chunks uh, what we didn't. Uh, in the end, that offer was, was not accepted, and uh, I heard from him subsequently that he actually had sold his collection for $75,000, his asking price. Holy crap. Which is just astounding to me. Um, I don't know. I've got no proof that this has actually happened, but uh, he, the seller told me that he, he found a buyer in, in Victoria. Yeah, I, I don't really know what was in the collection that would make it worth that much, but... Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm astounded by the whole transaction, if it's really happened uh, the way he's, he's told me it's gone down. Yeah, I'd certainly be interested to hear from whoever bought the bought that collection what they were thinking and what they plan to do with all that stuff. Yeah, I'm looking forward to potentially seeing some of it become available, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah there, were, there were a few things that he listed in there that, that were, you know, really desirable cards. I think there were some transwarps and some other stuff. Yeah, there were at least eight accelerator cards between Franz Warps and Zips. So do you think that this is just one guy who collected all this stuff over a lifetime and then decided he wanted to be rid of all of it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where he where he got it all from, but he indicated that he'd collected collections of stuff over time and just amassed it all into one, one spot. I wonder if he was a private collector or a former retailer like Wayne Bibbins in New York. His trade, I believe, is a, he's a truck driver, so I think he's not necessarily... A former retailer, but um, he's obviously managed to collect stuff in large quantity over time. I can't necessarily see on eBay where it says that this item was sold or this auction ended. It was not closed through the uh, the eBay process. The final auction um, just closed with no bids. Yeah, I remember in December it was it said this listing has been removed or this item is not available. But it doesn't say that now if you still go to that same auction listing on eBay. I, I don't know if maybe that notice just expires after a certain amount of time, but it definitely doesn't specify who won or what the winning bid was. It just says bidding has ended. Yeah, look, the, there was no bid on the auction. I'm not surprised at that price. 
for anyone who was wondering, these the seventy five thousand dollars, obviously, since this item was for sale in New South Wales, that's Australian dollars. The current day equivalent in United States dollars would be eighty thousand. So not significantly different, but also still a significantly high amount of money to ask for this lot. All right, uh, I think we have a few more reasonable auctions on the lot this month. Uh, one of the ones that caught my eye was the Kensington Turbo Mouse. Either of you ever used this? I've not used the the old Turbo Mouse for the Apple II, but I am a fan of their current trackball lineup. I use I use their trackballs on all my computers. And you prefer the trackball to the typical mouse or trackpad? I do. I um, it's it's easier on my wrist and fingers, and I seem to be better at controlling that than a, a mouse. Because certainly trackpads seem to be the way we're going nowadays with all the different touch gestures. The Turbo Mouse is still in production as a USB model, but the ADB, or Apple Desktop Bus model that was created back in the day, was a fantastic input device for the Apple II. It had uh, multiple buttons, and I don't know if the right-click button works with Sheppy's side-click, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does. You can still get ADB trackballs on eBay, and the one that I'm looking at, the auction ends in four days, and the starting bid is 26 bucks, which is actually pretty reasonable for a piece of hardware like this. I think a brand new USB trackball for the Mac would probably go for like 100 bucks. so 26 for the Apple II is a good deal. Andrew, what is your input device of choice? Um, the keyboard. <laughs> I, I suppose, you know, I would have to agree with that. I use a trackball with several of my very first Macintoshes when I was running Mac OS Classic, what it's now known as. And once I switched to OS X, I just found that there were more keyboard shortcuts that I was able to incorporate into my workflow, and I found myself taking my hands off the keyboard and reaching for that trackpad or trackball less often. And so once I switched to OS X, I was like, I'm done with trackballs. It's, it's sort of interesting, considering Steve Jobs' design philosophy was all about the mouse and, and trying to reduce keyboard use as much as possible. I, as I recall, that's one of the reasons that he uh, did not include arrow keys on the first Macintosh keyboards in no uh, Isaacson's biography on Steve Jobs, there was a, a story that, that he told about how a girl approached Steve for an autograph, and she had one of those big Apple ADB keyboards that had all the function keys and all the stuff that was added after he left, uh, asking for an autograph. He said that he would only sign it if she let him pry off those keys, and so and so she did. So he popped off the arrow keys and all the function keys from her keyboard before he signed it. And what year was this? Um, I don't remember the year. This would have been, he was no longer at Apple. These, this was a keyboard that she had, that, that had been designed after he'd left with all the function keys and, and stuff that he didn't want on the keyboard because he wanted people using the mouse because it felt it was a more elegant solution. So we're talking late nineties, right? Um, yeah, probably so. Okay. I, I would need to go back and, and look that paragraph up in the book. I was just wondering because I think there are eras in which Steve Jobs was more or less of a jerk or at least a different kind of jerk. And so I was wondering when he asked this girl, can I pop the keys off your keyboard? Was he actually being spiteful or was he just being good natured and making a joke? I, I think the way Isaacson told it, it was kind of a, a tongue in cheek sort of let's have fun with this thing. I, I can see that because otherwise you're just bullying a kid. Right. Yeah. But I, I do know that he was very, you know, Jobs was never big on the arrows or anything like that. So in an effort to continue expanding the international appeal of the show, we have found on eBay a Japanese Apple II. It's being advertised as a J+. The description says that it is a keyboard with katakana characters on them. It also has a Videx video term card. I guess that's not stock, but somebody has integrated it. Uh, it seems to be a used system. Of course, they all are nowadays. It says the Apple II J Plus was announced in Japan in July 1980, and it's based on the Apple II Plus. The original retail market price was... 358,000 yen, which nowadays would translate to $4,400. Obviously, there is some inflation at work there, so I would have to find a calculator to go back to 1980, but still a lot of money. Unfortunately, by the time we're recording this podcast, the auction has just recently closed, earlier today actually, and it sold for the reasonable price of $550. Andrew, are there any differences between an American Apple II and an Australian Apple II? Yeah, the power supply primarily. Um, some some of the models were available in PAL, different video, obviously. Not too many other differences. So if one were to go on eBay, it would not be justified to label it as rare. Well, it, it's rare compared to the number of listings that are out there at the moment, I guess. If you can't find it, it's rare. That's true. Yeah, an, an Australian Apple II Euro Plus, probably very similar to the European model. So that was a 
PAL output from the TV and um, then the, the 2GS Platinum 2E both remained as NTSC out. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really a hardware expert either, so you might like to check that Australian-US differences with uh, an expert like Tony before going to air with that. Oh, but we upset more people and get more feedback when we're blatantly wrong. That's right. <laughs> that, that's our secret strategy to get <laughs> listeners. It's kind of like we're the Howard Stern of the Apple II world. You're trolling the Apple II world. Now I understand from the inside. You know, I've, I've, been on the, I've been on the other side of this. <laughs> no wonder this show is so awful. They're doing it on purpose. Right. They're trying to suck. They're excellent at being terrible. I think you just got your outtake right there. <laughs> <laughs> outtake? That's an intake. <laughs> that's, that's our intro. <laughs> uh, let's see. Back to reality. I found a more reasonable Apple II setup, although maybe not reasonable is the right word. Typical. It's an Apple II GS with six and a quarter megabytes of RAM. That's an unusual number, isn't it? Because the ROM 3 came with one and a quarter megs, didn't it? That's almost right. <laughs> What's actually right? Uh, it's 1.125 megabytes. And the ROM 1 came with a quarter of a one meg. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, this Apple II GS on eBay is a ROM 1, and it has six and a quarter megabytes. So that means somebody added a six megabyte RAM card? Yeah. GS RAM Plus had the ability to have strange amounts of RAM on it, so 6 megs sounds about right. Oh, okay. I, obviously, it's just more typical to see some power of 2, like 4 or 8. Yeah, certainly typical, especially when you consider that um, DMA worked worked better at 4, so it seemed, tended to max out at 4 or 5 if you had a ROM 3. But in addition to that, the setup also comes with an Apple II high-speed SCSI card, an 80 megabyte hard drive, 3.5 inch floppy drive, ADB mouse, ADB keyboard. So nothing all that atypical, but it looks like a pretty clean setup. He says it's not really it's not really been used. Uh, he says there's a small dent here, but it's not really noticeable. It's it's a cleaner eBay listing than I'm used to seeing, and I don't know if that necessarily justifies the price of $675 for buy it now. You can also make an offer, try to get a little bit less. And I've actually had that work for me, but... Looks like he's got an original uh, original box there, a cardboard box. That'd be worth quite a bit. Oh yeah, I see that. Uh, I see a box for the floppy drive. And then he also says that you can customize what software it comes with, although I'm not sure it's clear what software he's offering. I think basically what he's going to do is just... Whatever you ask for, he'll go online, find it by whatever means, and use programs like Disk Maker or Disk to File to convert it and install it on the hard drive that it comes with. I can only assume that he's going to go to authorized and legal outlets for Apple II software because those are the only kinds that exist. Okay, and um, in eBay finds this is less, uh, I guess, about the item specifically uh, and more about kind of the way. The, the tech press reacted to it. I, Engadget picked up. There's an auction. There was an auction for a, a Black Bell and Owl uh, a, l- a little while ago, and uh, the unofficial Apple Web blog also picked up on it. it. It just it was portrayed as as this very rare Apple II that you never see, and this and that. And it's kind of strange because if they had done any research at all, um, I mean they're they're not as common as two GSs or two E's or anything like that. But they get listed on a fairly regular basis, and the one that that they picked up on wasn't even it wasn't that rare and it wasn't in great condition. Uh, and I just thought that was kind of strange. You know, maybe they should have done a little research first. Why do you think this auction received the press coverage it did? That I don't know. Uh, I think somebody tweeted about it. And I guess maybe one of the, the editors at, at Engadget follows that person and went and saw it. Because there was, there was a, a Bell & Howell that sold a week earlier that was in the original Apple II case with the raised uh, power light, which is a lot more rare than the, the later ones, which all came in the Black II Plus cases, um, and that one was in, in nicer condition. Yeah, I would think that something with this much press coverage would have sold for more than the $455 that it went for. Yeah, that's that's about average, I guess, for those the, the Darth Vader Apple IIs, so maybe, maybe the readers kind of knew better. Yeah, I would, I would think that... If the press outlets that were advertising this auction didn't know better, then the number of readers might not have either, and they would have been, I don't know, just they would have fallen for the hype. But I'm glad to hear that didn't happen. Yeah, me too. I also found on eBay something called a Dumpling 64 slotware. It looks like it's simply a buffered parallel printer interface. 
You know, I remember having one of these for my image writer. It was 32K because it used to be data was basically going directly from the computer to the printer at a speed equal to how fast the printer could print it. So if you had a, five pages of text, you had to pretty much wait for those five pages to finish printing before you could take control of your Apple II back and go on and do something else. With 32K of printer RAM, you can just let the file sit in that little buffer between the computer and the printer and go about your merry business. And it sounds like a trivial thing, but it's a nice luxury to have. I don't know if either of you ever were in a position where you were so frustrated by your printing speed that you had the need for a buffer. I actually did have a, a buffered printer card. I think it, I think the one I had was uh, by Orange Micro. I would spend a lot of time on BBSs and stuff, and I would always um, capture the output. And then when I was done with the call, I would print out the the capture and just walk away for a while because it'd be 20, 30 pages of the messages I posted and things like that. And so having that card was nice because I could, I could dump it and then continue to call the next BBS or, or do whatever else it was I was going to do. Why were you printing instead of just saving a disk? Um, that's just what I did. I don't know. No, I mean, I did the same thing and probably it's because paper was cheaper than floppy disks. That may have, that may have been it. Yeah. I just, right. I always dumped everything like that to, to paper. I, I still have, um, several still have several boxes filled with printouts in the basement of, of the various PBSs I visited. So how high is that on your priority list of things to scan? <laughs> it's not at all. <laughs> it's very specific, you know. They're very small BBSs, and, and I don't know that it, they would be of much interest to anybody else. No, but it's but it's an artifact of the era that can't be found anywhere else. Sometimes you find truth of an era reflected not in what the masses were doing, but in what the individuals were doing. So you see historical significance in arguing over the rules of a door game? Oh, absolutely. Especially, what game was it? (laughs) I don't remember. If we lived in the same geographic region, I wouldn't have been surprised to find my own name in those arguments. I would have to go through and censor them anyway. Censor them? Why? I was not always well behaved on BBSs. (laughs) And you're so much better now. (laughs) Well, there were... I won't go into that. Never mind. (laughs) Yeah, I I was not the... uh model of maturity myself during the age that BBSs were popular. I'm just glad that internet access is cheaper now than long-distance phone calls were back then. And finally on eBay this month, we have a rare Stephen Wozniak signed Apple One schematic diagram. Now let's see. I looks like this is a schematic that was signed by... Hold on. Signed by Woz. Seller. And it's got Woz's signature on it. Oh, that's right. You're right. This is the this is the store called Signed by Woz, which we have mentioned before. They know Steve Wozniak personally, and he in person signs a variety of products that they then sell through the store. But this is an actual uh, Apple One schematic, but I don't think it's an original. It says it's been reproduced on archival paper. So this is not from the 1970s, but it is a schematic of what was created in the 1970s. Well, what's cool, and I think we've talked about this before too, is that that if you actually go to their web page, you can send your own items in to them, and they'll have Waz sign it and send it back to you. And how do they determine the price for that? Uh, You tell them what you're going to send, and they give you a price. Ah, fair enough. Yep. So it's not like they have a price list you can just look up your object on. Uh, Not when I was looking at them. They did not. Mm -hmm. They they might have updated it. It's been a while since I visited the web page. So how much value do you put on a sign that is authentically signed by Stephen Wozniak, but it's not itself an authentic original? Priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Just his name on anything, huh? I've got a PowerBook 1400 with Woz's signature on the cover, and it's the machine I use is my portable 2GS, and it's priceless. Oh, the, the 1400, wasn't that known as the Wall Street? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wall, Wall Street said G3. This is a... This is the uh, PPC before G3, and I've got a PP. I've got a G3 upgrade card in it. Okay, I think I've owned both of those models of PowerBook or laptop Mac, and I just forgot which was which. But I seem to recall uh, Ryan was touting one of them as the ideal portable Apple II GS, probably because I think it still had a SCSI interface. Yeah, the PowerBook 1400's got a SCSI interface, and. Um... I think it's the ideal portable 2GS for running Bernie on. It, it doesn't do too well with uh, Sweet 16 and because it doesn't run Mac OS X. But um, with a PCMCIA hard drive and an Ethernet connection SCSI port, it's it's pretty good. 
Yes, the 1400 was, was codenamed Epic. And I did not just look that up online. You actually know this. Uh, sure, okay. <laughs> and then there was the 1400 <laughs> CS, which was very similar, right? Yes, and also codenamed Epic. Ah, the Epic CS. CS had a passive matrix screen, and the uh, the C had an active matrix display. Yeah, the CS is what I own. That may have been one of my first two Macs. I just, you know, I think the Wall Street was the last Mac I owned that wasn't running OS X. I brought it to K-Fest, and people were making fun of me for having such an old Mac, which is a strange criticism to hear at an Apple II convention. But yeah, I was peer pressured into upgrading, and I haven't looked back. Finally, I can play with the big kids. You caved to peer pressure. Eh, kind of like when Jeff Weiss tricked me into buying an iPod. Mm-hmm, tricked. Have I told you that story? <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll save it for another day for our listeners. You know, I've heard it too, so I think you've already burnt that one. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I need new stories. <laughs> well, if I'm that short on original content, then I am just going to sign off and say goodbye to Open Apple. <laughs> Hey, Andrew, you want to be a co-host on Open Apple? <laughs> sure. Um, same time next week? Absolutely. Uh, in, in that case, maybe I'll come back, but not for another month. Who's that talking? Hang up on him. Oh, fine. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you, Andrew, and I look forward to hearing your voice on all the future episodes. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, Mike and I have got some work to do to get our schedule together for next week, but um, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> And if I'm lucky, so will I. So for my co-host, Andrew uh, Rowan, um, this is Mike McGinnis signing off at Open Apple. Thanks for being on the show, Andrew, and thanks for representing your entire continent. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Talk to you later. This has been the Open Apple Podcast. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback by visiting us on the web at www.open-apple.net. Well, this so one what, is. Uh, so what makes? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask you what makes this new one different, but I'm not going to ask you uh, that because you're doing this transition uh, on your own. Why? Thank you, Ken. You're welcome. Um, I'm completely derailed now.